The greatest obstacle to discovering the truth is being certain you already have it. In the pages of the Old Testament, we encounter narratives of divine commands that seem to defy our understanding of a loving God. Stories of entire nations destroyed, men, women, and even children seemingly put to the sword. How do we reconcile these accounts with the God of mercy revealed in Jesus Christ? In this video, we'll grapple with the unsettling question, did God really order genocide in the Old Testament? We'll examine the historical context, the cultural practices of the time, and explore the deeper meaning behind these challenging passages. By the end of this video, you'll gain a clearer understanding of these events and discover how they ultimately point to God's unwavering love and justice for all humanity. The problem of violence in the Old Testament. The Bible can be a challenging book, especially when it reveals aspects of God that are difficult for our modern sensibilities to understand. One of the most unsettling themes in the Old Testament is the violence, particularly when we read about God commanding the destruction of entire cities, men, women, children, even livestock. How can this be reconciled with a loving God? Imagine this. You're a parent, and your child is playing in a beautiful garden. But in the corner of that garden is a patch of poisonous plants, a real danger to your child's life. What would you do? Would you let the child roam free, knowing they might be drawn to those plants? Or would you take decisive action to remove the threat even if it required drastic measures? This image of protection is one way we can begin to approach these troubling stories. Take, for example, the account of Jericho in Joshua 6.21, and they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, and ox, and sheep, and ass, with the edge of the sword. It's stark, it's brutal, and it's hard to digest. Similar language is found in Joshua 8.25 and Joshua 11.15, where we see this total annihilation repeated. The question naturally arises, how could God, who is described as love, allow or even command such destruction? Then there's the story of the Amalekites. In 1 Samuel 15, 3, God commands Saul to go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. These verses are tough, they shake us because they deal with innocent lives, particularly children, who seem far removed from the concept of sin. How do we reconcile this? Let's not gloss over the emotional weight of this question. God's mercy and compassion seem to hang in the balance, but to begin understanding, we must first grasp the context of these stories. The ancient world was one where violence was a part of daily life. Wars were common and the stakes were high. Entire civilizations would rise or fall depending on their ability to protect themselves or eliminate threats. When God commanded the Israelites to engage in these wars, it was not out of cruelty or capriciousness. It was out of necessity for the survival of His people and His plan of salvation. God's actions in these moments can be viewed through the lens of divine judgment, acts of justice against nations steeped in extreme wickedness, it's hard for us to fathom, but the Canaanites and the Amalekites were engaged in practices that were abominable, such as child sacrifice and rampant idolatry. God's intervention was not merely about land or dominance. It was about cleansing an environment that had become irreparably toxic. Think again about that parent in the garden. The poisonous plants represent sin. Unchecked, it spreads, it corrupts, and it kills. God in his wisdom, saw that without swift and complete intervention, this sin would contaminate his people, the very ones he was preparing to be a light to the nations. Left alone, the Israelites could have been swallowed by the same evils that consumed their neighbors. It's also important to note that God doesn't act impulsively. Throughout the Bible, we see a God who is patient, long-suffering, giving people ample time to repent and turn from their ways. This is evident when we read the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. In Genesis 18, God listens as Abraham pleads for the city, showing us a God who is not eager to destroy, but who waits, hoping for any sign of repentance. Now we must confront the hardest part of these stories, the children. Why did God include infants and children in these commands of destruction? 
This is where our finite understanding clashes with the infinite wisdom of God. As difficult as it is to say, God sees beyond what we can see. But we will explore this topic further in this video. Ultimately, we must remember that God's thoughts are not our thoughts, and His ways are not our ways. Isaiah 55, 8, and 9. In these stories of violence, we are given a glimpse into the seriousness of sin and the lengths to which God will go to protect His people from it. But we are also reminded of a God who desires mercy, who is patient, who waits for repentance, and who, in the end, offers redemption through Christ. God's patience and the fullness of sin. Think for a moment about a garden left unattended. Weeds begin to grow, small at first, almost unnoticed. Day by day, the weeds spread, and eventually, they take over the entire garden. Now imagine the gardener standing by, watching this happen, knowing that one day those weeds will choke the life out of every plant. He doesn't rush to destroy the weeds right away. Instead, he gives them time, hoping for some other solution, but he knows in the end, the weeds must be removed. This is how God dealt with the Canaanites. You see, God's patience is not like ours. While we may be quick to judge, quick to take action when we see something wrong, God is long-suffering. He gives people time, time to change, to repent, to turn from their evil ways. The Canaanites, the Amorites, and many other nations in the Old Testament were no exception to this. They had generations to turn from their ways before God's judgment finally came upon them. Let's take a closer look at this through God's words to Abraham in Genesis 15, 16. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. What is God saying here? He's saying that there is a limit to sin, a point at which it becomes so overwhelming, so deeply rooted, that action must be taken. But until that time, God holds back. The Amorites, a people living in Canaan, were given centuries to turn from their wicked practices. God didn't rush in with judgment, He waited. He allowed their sin to reach its fullness before He acted. Picture this, God watching over them, waiting, giving space for repentance. Every sunrise was a chance to turn from evil. Every harvest was a sign of God's patience, hoping that perhaps one day they would change. But as the years passed, their wickedness only deepened. We may ask, why would God wait so long? Couldn't He have intervened earlier, spared them from spiraling into such corruption? But that's not how God works. He's not quick to anger, not eager to punish. In fact, in 2 Peter 3, 9, we're told that the Lord is not slack concerning His promise as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us ward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God gives time, because His heart is always for redemption, not destruction. Now think about the Israelites, they were waiting too. They had been promised the land of Canaan, but God told them it wasn't time yet. Why? Because as He said, the iniquity of the Amorites was not yet full. Even as God was preparing His people to enter the land, He was still holding out hope for the Amorites. He was still giving them time. And even when the Israelites questioned this, wondering if their enemies were too far gone, God's response was clear. I love them and want to save them. It wasn't yet time for judgment. This patience, this waiting, is a picture of how God deals with all of us. He waits. He gives us every opportunity to turn from our ways to repent. But there comes a point when sin reaches its fullness. And when that time comes, God, in His righteousness, acts. For the Amorites, it took over 400 years for their iniquity to reach its limit. God didn't act in haste. He acted after long patience, after waiting until there was no other way. The lesson here is not about the destruction itself, but about the extraordinary length God goes to in order to give people a chance to turn from sin. And here's the sobering truth. God's patience, while vast, is not without limits. There comes a time when He must act, when justice must be served, but not before He has exhausted every opportunity for repentance. In our lives today, we are the recipients of that same patience. How often has God waited for us, giving us time to turn back to Him? How often has He delayed judgment, offering us mercy instead? But we must remember that while God's love is endless, 
His patience with sin is not. There will come a day when the fullness of our iniquity is reached and God will act, not in cruelty, but in righteousness. So let us not mistake God's patience for indifference. He is watching, waiting, and hoping that we will turn back to Him before it is too late. The Horrific Canaanite Sins The Canaanites were not just another ancient people living in their corner of the world. They were steeped in practices that are difficult to even comprehend today. Chief among these practices was child sacrifice. Imagine the horror. Children, innocent and defenseless, being offered up to a lifeless idol, Moloch, a god they believed demanded their blood. Not just in the privacy of homes, but publicly, they would place their infants in the arms of a massive bronze figure, shaped like a bull, and burn them alive. This wasn't a rare event. It was a deeply ingrained part of their culture their religion. Archaeologists have unearthed evidence of this in places like Gezer, where jars filled with the bones of sacrificed infants were found. These discoveries aren't just historical facts. They paint a picture of a society so corrupted by evil that they thought the murder of their own children would bring favor from the gods. We need to feel the weight of this. Parents who should have been protectors were turning their children into offerings to a god that had no power, no life. The Bible doesn't stay silent on this issue. God, who's the source of all life, finds this practice abhorrent. In Leviticus 22-5, he speaks directly to this sin, saying, Whosoever he be of the children of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn in Israel, that giveth any of his seed unto Moloch, he shall surely be put to death. The punishment was clear because the crime was unthinkable. God would not tolerate the shedding of innocent blood, especially not the blood of children. His command to eradicate the Canaanites, in part, was a response to this horrific evil. Now some might wonder, why did it come to this? Why didn't God just warn them or give them more time to change? But God did wait. Remember, the Canaanites, like the Amorites, had been given over 400 years. Generation after generation, they continued in their ways, growing more entrenched in their sin. God's judgment wasn't hasty. It was the result of sin reaching its full measure and one of the clearest signs of that was their continued practice of child sacrifice. Picture a doctor faced with a patient whose limb has become infected with gangrene. The infection has spread so far that if it's not dealt with, the entire body will die. The doctor doesn't want to amputate, but in this case, there's no other choice. The amputation is painful and it seems harsh, but it's necessary to save the rest of the body. In the same way, God's judgment on the Canaanites, though severe, was necessary to prevent the spread of evil. It was an act of protection, not just for the Israelites, but for future generations who might have been drawn into those same destructive practices. God's justice is not like human justice. It is perfect, without bias, without haste. And while we struggle to understand it fully, we can be sure that God, in His perfect wisdom, knew that this evil needed to be stopped. When he gave the command to Israel to destroy the Canaanites, it was not a blind act of cruelty. It was a righteous judgment on a people who had fully turned away from him and embraced practices that defiled the very sanctity of life. And yet, even in this, we see God's heart for life. His laws for Israel made it clear that life, especially innocent life, was sacred. That's why he set such strict penalties for those who would dare offer their children to false gods. God's ultimate desire was for his people to live in a land where life was valued, where children were nurtured and protected, not sacrificed. God's judgment may seem harsh to us, but it was always in response to sin that had reached its breaking point. The Canaanites were given centuries to repent, but they chose not to. The result was divine justice a justice that came after long suffering but which could no longer be delayed. Purpose of the Conquest When we talk about the conquest of Canaan, it's easy to imagine a scene of bloodshed and victory, where one nation rises and another falls. But to understand the true purpose behind it, we have to look deeper. This wasn't a story of ethnic superiority, territorial greed, or personal gain for the Israelites. It was about something much more significant, a battle for the preservation of worship and devotion 
to the true God. Imagine a house filled with toxic fumes, deadly to anyone who breathes it in. The house might be beautiful, well-constructed, but the fumes are invisible killers. Now someone comes along to remove those toxic elements. It's not because they want to destroy the house or steal it for themselves, but because the house, in its current state, is uninhabitable. The conquest of Canaan was like that. It was about clearing out the spiritual toxicity, not just for Israel, but for anyone who would live in that land. God had a specific plan for the Israelites. He wanted them to live in a land where idolatry did not have a foothold, where the worship of false gods, gods that led people to do unthinkable things like sacrificing their own children, would be eliminated. This wasn't about spoils of war or enriching the nation of Israel. In fact, God specifically forbade them from taking spoils. Think back to the story of Jericho in Joshua 6. The city was delivered into their hands, and they were commanded not to take anything for themselves. But one man, Achan, disobeyed. He took a Babylonian garment, silver and gold, and hid them in his tent. What happened? God's wrath fell on the entire community. In Joshua 7, we see the consequence. Israel suffered a crushing defeat in their next battle, and the whole community faced judgment until Achan's sin was uncovered and dealt with. Why such a severe reaction? Because the conquest was never about personal gain. It was about purifying the land, cleansing it from the corrupt influences that had taken root, and establishing a place where the worship of the true God could flourish. Achan's actions showed a disregard for that purpose. By taking those items, he tainted the very mission God had given Israel. He acted out of greed, and in doing so he disrupted the divine plan. The conquest of Canaan was also about protection. Israel was surrounded by nations that not only worshipped false gods, but were bent on destroying them. God allowed the Israelites to engage in warfare, not because he delighted in violence, but because it was necessary for their survival. This was defensive warfare. They were up against nations that, had they been left unchecked, would have swallowed Israel whole, pulling them into the same idolatry and rebellion against God that those nations practiced. Now we come to something important, the language used in these commands. When we read the Bible in English, we often see clear, direct commands from God. But the Hebrew language, in which much of the Old Testament was written, carries nuances that are sometimes lost in translation. For example, in Genesis 2.16, God says to Adam, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. The original Hebrew says, Eating you shall eat. This isn't a strict command, but more of a permission or allowance. In the same way, when God commands Israel to engage in warfare, it could sometimes be understood as allowing them to do so under the circumstances. There's a difference between God commanding an action and God allowing it in response to the situation. The Hebrew language often uses the active form to express what we might call divine permission. Take Exodus 1.17, where the Hebrew midwives were told to kill the male Hebrew children, but they feared God and did not as the king of Egypt commanded. The language here shows that while the king gave a command, the midwives were permitted to disobey because of their fear of God. Similarly, in Jeremiah 24, 1, God allows the Babylonians to take captives from Judah. But this was not God delighting in suffering. Rather, he permitted it in response to the people's continued rebellion. Understanding this linguistic nuance helps us see that, while God gave Israel permission to engage in warfare, his ultimate goal wasn't violence but the establishment of a holy people, free from the corrupting influences of idolatry. God's intentions were always clear, purge the land of the destructive practices that led people away from him and don't let personal greed or gain interfere with the mission. The conquest of Canaan was a means to establish a people dedicated to the true God, a land where his commandments would be upheld and where future generations could live free from the spiritual darkness that had overtaken the region. This was never about one people being better than another. It was about God's desire for purity, holiness, and devotion. And it shows us something about God's character. He is a God of justice, but also a God of purpose, who desires His people to live in the light of His truth, free from the snares of idolatry that destroy both body and soul.
When you read through the Old Testament, you come across some pretty intense language, phrases like utterly destroyed or left nothing that breathed. It's hard not to imagine complete and total annihilation. But here's where we need to understand something crucial. The Bible, like many ancient texts, often uses hyperbole. That is, it exaggerates for effect, not to mislead, but to emphasize the magnitude of the victory or the seriousness of the situation. Let's break it down a bit. Imagine a coach giving a halftime speech to a basketball team. He might say, we're crushing them. Now we understand that this doesn't mean the other team has been physically harmed beyond repair. It's just an expression of how well one side is playing. The same kind of language is found in the Bible, particularly when it talks about battles and warfare. Take Joshua 11, 21 to 22 as an example. It says, Joshua, cut off the Anakims from the mountains, from Hebron, from Debir, from Anab, and from all the mountains of Judah. It then emphasizes that Joshua utterly destroyed them with their cities. This sounds like Joshua wiped them off the face of the earth, right? But just a couple of chapters later in Joshua 14, 12, Caleb is asking for help to drive out the Anakims from that same region. It's clear they weren't completely annihilated as we might have initially understood. What does this mean? The phrase destroyed completely was likely hyperbolic, a way to highlight the totality of Joshua's victory rather than a literal extermination of every single person. In fact, this is a common practice in ancient Near Eastern literature. People of that time often used exaggerated language to emphasize a decisive victory or the dominance of one group over another. We see the same thing in Joshua 1040, where it says that Joshua smote all the country of the hills and of the south and of the vale and of the springs and all their kings. He left none remaining, but utterly destroyed all that breathed. But later, in Joshua 23, 12 and 13, we find that Joshua is warning the Israelites about the nations that still remained in the land. Again, it's clear that the language of total destruction wasn't meant to be taken in the strictest literal sense. This kind of hyperbolic language doesn't just show up in the Bible. Other ancient cultures used it too. Consider a Babylonian chronicle describing King Nebuchadnezzar's victory over the Egyptians at Carchemish. It boasts that he reduced them to non-existence, but we know from history that Egyptian forces continued to exist afterward. Or take an Egyptian record from the time of Thutmose III, which claims he annihilated the kingdom of Mitanni. But later Mitanni reappears as an ally of Egypt. These aren't historical contradictions. They're examples of how ancient people communicated overwhelming victory. A classic example within the Bible itself is found in 1 Samuel 15, where Saul is commanded to utterly destroy the Amalekites, including their livestock. Yet later, in 1 Samuel 27, 8, David and his men are fighting the Amalekites again. The Amalekites weren't wiped out to the last man. The language was used to emphasize the severity of God's judgment against them. But why use hyperbole? In part, it was a way to communicate the seriousness of what was at stake. For the Israelites, these battles weren't just physical. They were spiritual. The stakes were high because idolatry and the evil practices of these nations could infect Israel's relationship with God. So when the Bible says utterly destroyed, it's signaling not just a military victory, but a spiritual cleansing of the land, preparing it for the worship of the one true God. Now some might wonder why such violent imagery was used at all. To understand that, we have to take a step back and look at the historical context. Warfare in the ancient Near East wasn't like what we think of today. Back then, war was a part of life. Cities were fortified with thick walls and nations engaged in battle regularly, whether for self-defense or territorial expansion. The ethical codes surrounding warfare were different. War wasn't an exception. It was a reality of survival. In that world, when a nation went to battle, victory meant more than just defeating an army. It was about establishing dominance and ensuring survival. That's why the Bible uses such intense language to describe the victories of Israel. It was a way of signaling to both Israel and the surrounding nations that God was in control, and His people would not be overrun by those who practiced wickedness. So, when you read those tough passages about destruction in the Old Testament, remember that the language is often figurative, not literal. It paints a picture of the completeness of victory or judgment rather than a precise historical record of extermination.
This use of hyperbole was a common way for ancient people to communicate power in totality. But even in the midst of these intense accounts, we see that God's ultimate concern was always about the purity of His people, ensuring that they could live free from the influence of idolatry, violence, and evil practices that would destroy their relationship with Him. Interpreting the Death of Children When we come across the death of children in the Bible, especially in the context of God's commands during the conquest of Canaan, it can feel deeply troubling. It's a hard topic to face. Innocent lives cut short in what seems like the wake of divine judgment. How could a loving God allow such a thing to happen? Let's step back for a moment and think about a scenario. Imagine a child playing near the edge of a cliff. The wind is strong, and one misstep could send them tumbling down to certain death. You see the danger coming before they do. Out of love, you run and snatch the child away, even if it means pulling them so hard they stumble or cry. To an onlooker, it might seem harsh in that moment. But to you, it's a necessary act of love because you see the bigger picture. They don't understand the danger they're in. In some ways, we can look at God's actions in the conquest of Canaan similarly. Yes, it's difficult for us to comprehend, but we must remember that God, in His infinite wisdom, sees far beyond what we can. He knows the dangers that lie ahead, both in this life and in eternity. The Canaanite culture was deeply steeped in wickedness. Child sacrifice, rampant idolatry, and the worship of false gods were a part of daily life. The environment in which these children were growing up was one of spiritual and moral corruption. God in His mercy may have seen their early deaths as an act of protection. Instead of allowing them to grow up in that culture, where their souls would be further damaged, He spared them from the fate of becoming entrenched in a life separated from Him. Additionally, we must consider the free will of the parents who were entrusted with the responsibility of protecting their children. God places a heavy burden on parents to raise their children wisely, and this responsibility must be taken with utmost care. Their sin and corrupt practices over generations brought a curse upon themselves and their offspring. This is not easy to grasp because we value life, especially innocent life. But God's perspective is eternal. He is not limited by time or circumstance, and He always has the soul's destiny in view. In His infinite wisdom, He might have viewed the death of these children as a way to protect them from a lifetime of spiritual destruction. In Deuteronomy 29.29 it says, The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever. There are mysteries of God's judgment that we may never fully understand on this side of eternity. But one thing we do know is that His character is always consistent. He is just, He is merciful, and He is good. And this brings us to the heart of God's character, His ultimate love and redemption. God's love for humanity. God's ultimate character is one of love and redemption. This is the foundation of everything we know about Him. The Bible continually reminds us that God is good, and this goodness isn't just a concept. It's a living reality that manifests in how He deals with us. His goodness shows up as love, forgiveness for sinners, and yes, punishment for those who persist in wrongdoing. It's a balanced picture of a just God, but also a deeply merciful one. One of the most comforting verses is found in 2 Peter 3.9, where we learn about God's heart toward humanity. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us ward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. This is a picture of God's patience. He delays judgment, not because He's slow or indifferent, but because He's waiting for as many people as possible to turn to Him. His desire is for salvation, not destruction. He longs for His children to return to Him offering every single one of us the chance for forgiveness, healing, and redemption. God's love for humanity is unwavering. No matter how far we wander, no matter how deep our sins go, His love goes further still. Like the father in the parable of the prodigal son, He's always watching, always waiting, eager to run and embrace His children when they come back to Him. That's the beauty of redemption. God doesn't just tolerate us, He actively seeks to restore us. If you've watched this far, type, God is just and merciful in the comments. And let me know your thoughts on His justice and mercy. These are big concepts, and I'd love to hear your perspective.
And if this video helped you understand God's justice in a new way, don't forget to subscribe for more deep dives into the Bible and challenging topics like this one. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your justice, but even more so for your incredible mercy. You are patient with us, far more than we deserve, and your love is greater than we can comprehend. Help us to trust in your perfect wisdom even when life is confusing and your ways are hard for us to understand. We ask for your forgiveness where we've fallen short and thank you for always offering redemption and a fresh start. Draw us closer to you and help us to walk in your truth and light every day. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. times the cities fell by higher will the stories tell a judgment came a blaze of light yet mercy shone throughout the night god of justice god of grace in your hand we find our place through the darkness you are near Guiding hearts, dispelling fear The Amorites with hearts of stone In shadows lived far from your throne Yet even there you waited long Your patience, Lord, forever strong God of justice, God of grace In your hand we find our place Through the darkness You are near Guiding hearts Dispelling fear And then the world Is cold and gray We stumble seeking Out our way but you watch with loving eyes Lifting hearts toward the skies God of justice, God of grace In your hand we find our place Through the darkness you are near Guiding hearts, dispelling fear quick now you can engage even more and support this channel by becoming a member becoming a member unlocks amazing resources and helps you connect even deeper get access to every image i use perfect for your wallpaper studies or presentations need a custom visual for a study group or a bible verse that speaks to you i'll design it and members get to suggest entire video topics they'd love to see explored honestly this is about more than perks it's your chance to directly shape the content and help me create videos that matter most to you. Check the description for details. Thanks so much for being part of this community. God bless.